Good morning. Uh, I'm Susan Poser, and I welcome you to the Fall 2020 Leadership Retreat. This year, the topic is Building Excellence and Community Online. Putting this event online allows us for the first time to invite the whole faculty and make this primarily a professional development opportunity led by the faculty. I want to start by acknowledging the work of Kelsey O'Shea, my executive assistant, who organized the retreat and the breakout sessions, and of Deborah Hale, who created the web page where the breakout sessions are listed, along with their Zoom links. I also want to thank all of the faculty and staff who are presenting the breakouts today. They so generously volunteered time and effort to provide this service to the UIC community, which is ultimately for the benefit of our students. The breakouts will be recorded along with the rest of the presentations today and posted on the web as a teaching resource. Before we get to that part of the program, I'm going to spend about 30 minutes on an academic year in review. And I have to apologize in advance for leaving out important information and events. There's no way to do justice to that all that has gone on this year in 30 minutes. After that, there will be three short presentations about teaching online that should be of interest to everyone. And then there will be the opportunity to go into breakout sessions with faculty and staff talking about specific instances of building excellence online. So let's get started. This is a strange year to say that I hope everyone had a good summer, since I don't think many of us had much of a summer at all, if that means working a little less and taking a planned vacation. But hopefully everyone found some fun distractions. Now on to the year in review. First, I want to welcome two new administrators. Michael Lippitz began at UIC last October. He joined us after eight years at North Carolina State University, a Division I Atlantic Coast Conference program. Michael led a number of major initiatives at NC State, including the construction of the indoor practice facility and the creation of the NC State Athletic Hall of Fame. It's been great to work with Michael over the past 10 months. Dr. Erin O'Leary joined UIC as the inaugural executive director of the new UIC Center for Teaching Excellence on July 1st. As Dr. O'Leary comes to us from UCLA, where she served as the director of UCLA's Center for Education, Innovation, and Learning in the Sciences. In this role, she worked in collaboration with faculty across the campus to inspire change in teaching practices and provide resources to support transformation of the teaching culture. Please join me in welcoming Aaron and Michael to UIC. UIC seemed to suffer more losses this year than usual, so let's take a moment to remember and acknowledge them. We lost undergraduate student Ruth George to a senseless and horrible killing last fall. We lost several students to accidents away from campus, one quite recently, as well as current and emeriti faculty to non-COVID related disease. We lost two staff members in administrative services to COVID in April, and we have lost frontline workers in the hospital as well, early on in the course of this pandemic. Of course, the biggest news of the year was the onset of the COVID-19 global pandemic that is still in our midst. The faculty and staff did an extraordinary job making a transition last March to teaching and working entirely online. At faculty and student request, we quickly made several adjustments to policies about tenure rollbacks, teaching evaluations and grading, and set up two main task forces to look ahead to the planning of the fall 2020 semester. This task force, the Fall 2020 Academic Planning Task Force was made up of faculty, staff, and administrators, including representatives from the Faculty Senate, SCEP, and the Union. We met in subcommittees and as a full committee every week since April to lay out the plans for online and on-campus teaching. They recommended categories of classes that should be on campus. They recommended the framework for support of online teaching and helped organize resources for faculty teaching synchronous and asynchronous classes. The subcommittees were led very ably by Dibian Majumbar, Dara Crowfoot, and Lan Chaplin. Dr. Chaplin's subcommittee 
student perspectives ran many focus groups with students in order to understand their view of online teaching and their needs moving forward in the online environment. You will hear more about this shortly. Other members of the task force led by Lisa Freeman organized a focus group of students to explore why there was so much cheating in online classes last spring. The results of these focus groups informed faculty resources that the task force helped to create on the topics of online assessments, syllabus language, and building community online. This slide shows some of the topics on, that are on my website. You can get there by clicking on provost.uic.edu, which I'm going to show you now just as a quick demo. And then you can go down to online instructional resources for faculty. Some of these links here in the blue uh, go to ACCC and others go to resources created by the task force. In addition, you will find on this website upcoming events about online teaching, as well as past webinars. Quite a few faculty have stepped up to be online mentors to other faculty, and some of them are leading webinars about online teaching. There is also a growing list of articles from many different sources about online teaching and campus emails from the past five months related to academic matters. This material will eventually be moved to the new website of the new Center for Teaching Excellence, which I will show you in a moment. The Monitoring and Containment Working Group um, has been meeting since June to address on-campus operations in the summer and fall from a public health and safety perspective. As you can see from this slide, this group involved many of the physicians, scientists, and public health experts at UIC. This slide is just a quick reminder of the safety measures put in place on campus this semester. You have seen emails describing each of these. UI Health has many initiatives to reach out to assist, teach, and learn about COVID's effects on the community with everything from mask distribution to contact tracing. We are also the first site in Chicago for clinical trials for the efficacy of a vaccine by biotech company Moderna, led by UIC professor Rick Novak. And then in late May came the murder of George Floyd in Minnesota and the resulting outcry that continues to reverberate today. This is the other pandemic we are living with, except its history is much longer and its cure so much more complex. This is leading to continuing calls for much needed change across our society and in fact, the whole world. UIC faculty, staff and students have brought these calls for change to our campus and there have been many campus-wide efforts coordinated by members of the UIC community. This is just a very small sampling of these events. Included in the response were a town hall, two mixers supported by my office that included presentations by faculty and students. The chancellor has created working groups of faculty, students, and staff to make concrete recommendations. These two slides do not do justice to the number of events and the amount of support that has poured forth at UIC. There have been other town halls and forums sponsored by students in many of the colleges as well. We have a long way to go, but the Chancellor and I and the rest of the administration are dedicated to implementation of measures very soon that will lead to real change in our community. We need to seize this moment. Now I will provide a brief review of the year before COVID-19. A lot of good stuff happened before March 2020, but of course I'm only able to cover a very small part of it here. We continued the campus conversation with the help of many UIC faculty members as well as outside speakers. The goal of this series is to discuss issues of national and international importance that affect the lives of our students and our community and it is open to the whole UIC community. This is a shot of Dean Erwin Chemerinsky of the uh, UC Berkeley Law School with a panel of UIC faculty discussing free speech on campus. The East-West Research Mixers occur monthly at the Innovation Center and consist of very short presentations on a topic by UIC faculty from different disciplines and colleges across our university 
with the goal of having faculty learn about each other's research and then have time to meet and socialize afterwards. You can see that we had five at the Innovation Center last year and then four more on Zoom. We will continue these this fall on Zoom. The record-breaking enrollment growth over the past few years at UIC has primarily been in first-time freshmen with transfers holding steady. This year that is flipped and registrations are currently tracking 8% up in transfers and down 26% for, um, in first-time freshmen. Our continuing students are also higher than normal, up by about 10%. We will likely be down in first-time freshman enrollment, probably close to 15%, but much of that will be made up with very high transfer and continuing student numbers. There is a lot of volatility in the week before the semester and during the first two weeks, and we usually pick up several hundred students during this time. It is critical that the colleges continue to allow students to register up until the census day, which is September 4th this year. This is not the year to cut off registrations before then. This is a picture of uh, overall enrollment statistics over time. It shows steady growth um, in undergraduate enrollment over the past five years, which of course affects overall. The jump in professional students, which you'll see uh, in purple at the bottom, was primarily due to the addition of the law school last summer. Undergraduate enrollment, if we look at that uh, by itself, it shows what I mentioned a moment ago about the enrollment growth recently coming mostly from large increases in first time freshmen. This year will be different. The largest group of students, undergraduate students now, are Latinx, which continues to grow while white students decline. The African American numbers have been growing unacceptably slowly and not growing by percentages because of the other growth. That other growth includes international students where you can see the effect of shore light. Now I'll say a few words about trends in masters and PhD students. We see an increase in both applications and admissions between fall 2019 and fall 2020, although of course the 2020 numbers are tentative. There is a drop in the percentage of admitted students enrolling with 38.6% in 29, and so far only 26% in 2020. These numbers do vary a lot by college. And graduate students are notoriously late to register, so we expect many more students before census. But the overall decrease in master's enrollment reflects a substantial decrease in international student enrollment with domestic student enrollment staying pretty steady. This is unsurprising this year as many international students are choosing to defer their enrollment because of difficulties getting into the US. We see slight increases in both applications and admissions of PhDs in fall 2020, but a decrease relative to 2019 in the percentage of admitted students enrolling from 38% to 32% in 2020. Again, this likely reflects late registration by PhD students and also the negative effects of the pandemic on the ability of international students to gain entrance to the United States. I want to talk now a little bit about um, initiatives in the Vice Provost's office. The admissions website has had a redesign and as you can see, the admissions office is ready to go for fall 2020, which is the fall 2021 admissions cycle. They have many more online features, including an AI chat box, digital marketing, and virtual campus tours. We had an initiative this year to bring together the units outside of the colleges that support academic success in order to make all of them more accessible to students. Most of these resources were already in the Office of the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Affairs and Academic Programs, Nikos Varelis. AAAN, ACE, and NASP listed here at the top have now moved from student affairs to academic affairs and are in Nikos's office. We are creating a system both on campus and online whereby students can more easily access academic support by having all of the resources in one place, whether that be physically in SSB or on a website. The college units that do academic success remain with the colleges, but are networked in. 
Here is the current website, which is a work in, pro in progress. A major part of this effort was just completed with a new tutoring website, which I will now quickly show you. I can find my cursor. Hold on, there it is. One second. Okay. So here is this website right now. This is changing and going to be uh, in another spot, which I'll show you in a moment. But here is the tutoring website, and I just want you to see uh, what we have done with it. Um, now a student can find the kind of tutoring that they want by unit, by subject, or by course. So if you click on unit, the student can look at uh, different units and what they offer in terms of um, tutoring, pe both peer tutoring and professional tutoring. If we go back and we look at find tutoring by subject, they can find it in whatever subject they're looking for in particular. If you click on one of these, let's go to physics, you can find Honors College, Math and Science Learning Center, um, and uh, others which are probably still being added. Finally, you can go to a particular, a student can go to a particular course and find out what kind of tutoring um, there is in that course. And you can see this continues here for several pages. So this is just the beginning of uh, the work that we're doing in order to make all of these services more accessible um, to the students. Uh, and then I just wanna show you one other quick thing. Here is the comprehensive list of student resources. And this is something like, oops, that's the wrong thing. Well, okay, that's not working. If you go there, you will see um, all the various types of, um, of other things that will be on this website. It's not only gonna have academic support, it will have the hours of campus rec, it will have uh, mental health uh, and so forth. So uh, stay tuned for that, that should be done relatively soon. Okay, um, now on to diversity and uh, the Office of Diversity and Faculty Affairs. The Bridge to the Faculty is a new postdoctoral program designed to recruit underrepresented scholars with the goal of transitioning them to faculty members after two years. This recruitment initiative aims to attract and retain promising scholars to UIC, as well as diversify our faculty, with particular emphasis in departments with low or no presence of faculty who are underrepresented in their field. This program is funded by the Chancellor's Office and administered through my office. The resources for the postdoctoral positions and the faculty hires that result will be provided by central administration. You can see we will welcome 10 scholars representing nine departments uh, in the inaugural cohort. And we are also excited to welcome two affiliate scholars from the College of Nursing who are participating in the cohort programming. These scholars and affiliate scholars will be provided with mentorship through their home departments and tailored ancillary programming and one-on-one -on -one support coordinated through the Office of the Vice Provost for Diversity and in collaboration with a growing list of partners, including the Office of Postdoctoral Affairs and the Center for Teaching Excellence. The Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs, Nancy Freitag, is leading an effort to increase the number of prestigious awards and honors that our faculty receive. We are utilizing academic analytics to identify faculty who are eligible for these awards and working with deans and department heads to get faculty nominated. Last year, we made progress with AAAS fellows. We went from two to six. One of the important issues here is one cannot become a fellow without becoming a member of AAAS. So we've encouraged more than 50 faculty to become members so that they can be in this pipeline. This effort to increase faculty prestige awards includes all national and international awards. We are encouraging colleges and departments to form committees to focus on nominating faculty for these awards. As you heard, oops, as you heard a few minutes ago, we have now launched the Center for Teaching Excellence. Right now, to the extent that she's on campus, Dr. Erin O'Leary will be on the 25th floor of UH. In about a year, she will move to the Hillel Building on Taylor and Morgan, which we recently acquired and is now undergoing minor renovations. 
Erin is building a highly interactive center to support all members of the UIC community who have a teaching role, including faculty and teaching assistants. Elizabeth Romero and the Learning Technology Solutions team in ACCC is naturally aligned with the center and has played a critical role in supporting online teaching over the past five months by training TA course builders and offering countless consultations, webinars, and other resources to faculty. This fall, Dr. Romero's team will become part of the Center for Teaching Excellence to add instructional design, support for Blackboard, and classroom technology, technology support to the many resources the center will have available for our faculty. We've launched the website for the center, which I will show you now, because its focus for now is supporting the faculty this upcoming semester. So it is building out resources for online teaching. So it's just teaching.uic.edu. Here it is so far. And let me just show you uh, the syllabus toolkit right here. Click on that. You can see that there are ex there is extensive um, resources here uh, specialized into synchronous teaching, asynchronous teaching, and on-campus teaching. Um, and these are much more in depth than the two page uh, document that I sent around in a uh, circle back newsletter a couple of weeks ago. These go into much, much more detail uh, about uh, with ideas about syllabi. And then the other really important document here, or one of the other ones, is assessment guidelines. Uh, this is for doing assessments online. Again, just a wonderful uh, document uh, that was done uh, under the leadership of Aaron uh, and members of SCEP uh, from the uh, Senate, the Senate Committee on Educational Policy. So I encourage you to take a look at these. Oops. Okay, now I want to just give you a little bit of news from the colleges. These are just a few examples of what's been going on this year. Um, and they do not do justice to the many wonderful things happening at UIC as a result of the hard work and dedication of the faculty. In the College of Architecture, Design, and the Arts, Clinical Associate Professor Paul Anderson and Associate Professor Paul Preissner were selected to curate the U.S. Pavilion exhibition at the 17th Venice Architectural Biennale. Anderson and Preissner were selected in an open competition run by the U.S. State Department and won their project titled American Framing, which demonstrates the conditions and consequences of American wood frame construction. This is an extremely prestigious honor. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, the Biennale did not happen this spring and is now postponed until 2021. The UIC College of Education has received a $2.8 million gift for a project led by Professor Kathy Main to help expand the number of early childhood teachers in Chicago and surrounding areas. This is a critical issue and UIC has stepped up to help solve it. LAS has launched an initiative to celebrate and support the success of first generation college students through First at LAS, a program designed to enrich students' engagement with campus resources and opportunities, deepen their connections with faculty and peers, foster feelings of inclusivity and community, and contribute to their long-term academic and professional success. The College of Engineering has UIC's fastest growing computer science program, which received a major grant from Breakthrough Tech, a program that received new funding from Melinda Gates and others to help increase the number of women in tech. This is among the largest gifts ever to the College of Engineering. The College of Business Administration is rolling out a cohort program in the fall of 2020 for all incoming freshmen to increase retention and graduation rates in the college by creating a sense of belonging through shared experience. Students in these cohorts, numbering 50 or 60 each, will have classes together beginning in their first year and continuing through graduation. The UIC John Marshall Law School, which turned one year old just last Sunday, so congratulations to them, uh, remains the most diverse law school in the Midwest and is ranked seventh in the nation for legal writing. And this year boasted National Jurist Magazine's Law Student of the Year, a young woman named Ali Pruitt. The law school continues to provide millions of dollars in pro bono legal service, services in Chicagoland and beyond on an annual basis. 
Of course, the Health Sciences Colleges have been very involved in UIC's response to COVID-19. The College of Nursing has responded with scores of faculty and students stepping up to test and treat patients. They are proud to be the research home of Professor Shannon Zank, shown here, who was just named director of the National Institute of Nursing Research. In the past year, the faculty and staff of the College of Pharmacy retained the top 10 national rankings of the college in both research and overall in US news. They are providing life-saving medication services to patients during the pandemic and conducted research on treatments for COVID-19. The faculty in UIC's College of Medicine have performed critical work to improve the health of our communities and the nation during this pandemic by providing world-class clinical care to patients suffering from coronavirus infection, while also doing groundbreaking research on novel therapeutic agents and vaccines to fight COVID-19. The School of Public Health continues to play a leading role in the COVID-19 response in Chicago and Illinois, notably by advising the Illinois Department of Public Health, co-leading contact tracing efforts in the city and convening a strike force to address the growing needs of community organizations. UI Health is moving forward with critical capital projects, including a groundbreaking just last week and the impl implementation of EPIC, the new health information technology system for the hospital. Now, before getting to the main event today, the presentations and breakouts about online teaching, I'm going to show the updated set of slides that I show every year. These provide some perspective about where UIC sits in relation to other public universities. We start by comparing some of our statistics to other Research One HSI universities. HSI is a federal designation through the Higher Education Opportunity Act of a university with 25% or more total undergraduate Hispanic serving enrollment. This is an ever-growing list of schools. Some are urban and some and look very much like us and others are not. Here is a list of HSI universities, which has grown since last year with the addition of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, the University of Texas, El Paso, and the University of North Texas. If you look at the slides in this series, the best way to compare universities is by looking to the right at the names of the universities, which are in the same order and color as the most recent point on the graphs. The colors of the universities are not consistent across slides, but their names are always in the order that the last data point appears on the graph. You can see that among these universities, UIC students, which is always going to be the dotted red line, are in the middle in terms of ACT scores. Our median ACT went up, so we, we moved up from last year, passing a couple of schools. Notice also that this is for fall 2018, the last date for which we have comparison data. We are below the median in first to second year retention, placing 10th out of 15, although right now for the cohort that began in 2019, we are actually up to 81% retention this year. And second to third year retention has moved from 83% to 87% this year. That's not relevant to this slide, but I thought I'd let you know. Retention rates are good predictors of graduation rates, so it is not surprising that relatively speaking, we are, in, we are in close to the same place here as in reference to retention rates. Having said that, we are eighth out of 15 in graduation, but only 10th out of 15 in retention. This is a good indicator of the success of the academic student support programs that we provide to students throughout their time at UIC. It is also worth mentioning, as a, an aside at this point, that the six-year graduation rate for UIC for the 2014 cohort, which is the cohort that graduated in 2020, was up to 63%. So we, and, and that's where it is now, it could go up. Um, we, are, we have moved up five points since this chart was created in two years. When we look at ourselves as against these universities in terms of Pell Grants, which is a stand-in for low income, we see that we are second from the top, with only the University of Texas El Paso having a larger percentage of Pell students. But note that we significantly outperform El Paso in terms of retention and graduation rates. In fact, El Paso, if we go back for a second, is at the bottom of both the retention 
and the graduation rates. We are essentially tied with Texas Tech for graduation rates, but they have the fewest Pell students. When we look in the context of research expenditures at these same schools, we rank third among this group, with only Arizona and UC Irvine ahead of us. Arizona was second from the bottom of Pell students, and Irvine was just about in the middle. The universities here in bold have medical schools, which typically bring in a significant portion of the research funds. So what can we conclude from this set of slides? It's very unusual to have this many Pell eligible students, that is students from exceedingly modest households, something like under $40,000 a year income for a family of four, at a research university of UIC's caliber. In this case, I am having research expenditures stand in for a high-powered and successful faculty. This is, of course, not a complete equivalency since high research expenditures are not a measure in many of the disciplines, though I believe that if I used another measure, like publications, for those, for example, in arts and humanities, we would find those very high as well. So we see that it is also very unusual to have students from such challenging economic circumstances matched with faculty that is so high powered. And this leads to the next set of slides, which focuses on universities with comparable research expenditures rather than universities that are also HSIs. That is, I am shifting the focus now from similar student demographics at a university to similar faculty. The question is what do the measures of retention, graduation, and Pell numbers look like when we put ourselves in that group? These are the R1 universities that are within the same band of research expenditures as UIC. This, that band is 330 million to 400 million, and we just created it so that UIC would be in the middle. And so we do, we come in at 361, 680 in 2018 for this slide, again, intentionally near the middle of this group. You can see the under other universities in this band. So let's look at retention. Among this group of schools, you can see that we are one from the bottom with only Washington State behind us in retention. You can see that Caltech doesn't have a whole lot of problems with retention. Six year um, graduation, again, this time we are actually at the bottom or maybe tied at this point with Washington State. Again, Princeton graduates most of their students. But here are our Pell numbers, which are off the charts. Washington State and Kentucky are next, but almost half as many. The fewest Pell are Carnegie Mellon, Caltech, and the University of Miami. These were near the top for graduation rates. I'm going back to that slide. We know that financial reasons are the most cited for students dropping out of school. We have looked at our percentage of Pell students among Research One Hispanic serving institutions and among the Research One universities that have similar research expenditures to ours. The final slide about Pell students is to see where we stand among Research One universities overall. That is, which research, which research universities have the most Pell students? This shows the R1 schools with the highest percentage of Pell students. UIC is second among all of the 115 R1 universities in number of Pell eligible students. Only Texas at El Paso is higher. And again, recall that their retention and graduation was near the bottom and their research expenditures were under 100 million. Now I like to show this set of slides because it demonstrates both the magic and the challenges at UIC. The magic is that there is no other university in the country that matches such a high quality research faculty with such a diverse and financially challenged student population. This reflects our commitment to our access mission and that when we provide access, it is truly to an excellent education and opportunity with outstanding faculty. Pretty soon our country will look the way the demographics of our student body looks in terms of having no ethnic majority. So we are not just providing opportunity, we are creating the leaders of tomorrow across the disciplines. The challenge is that these students have a lot of needs. 
financial being the most obvious, but also other forms of support, including mental health, academic advising, and career counseling. This year, uh, will, this will be true even more than ever, as we navigate a mostly online curriculum without the benefit of much opportunity for in-person relationship building. This is the work you are all doing every day. I want to make sure you recognize how unique it is and that this, and that this uniqueness is supported by evidence and central to our mission at UIC. We are now at the main part of the retreat. Next, we will hear three 10-minute presentations about aspects of online teaching that are relevant to anyone doing so. After that, you have the opportunity to attend two breakout sessions on a topic of particular interest, choosing from 31 sessions, all presented by UIC faculty and staff. So now I'm going to introduce, here are three speakers. I will introduce each one before they go. As you heard earlier, Dr. Erin O'Leary is the founding executive director of the Center for Teaching Excellence who came to us recently from UCLA. Her presentation today will preview her plans for this new center and is entitled, Looking Ahead, Plans for the UIC Center for Teaching Excellence. So now I will stop sharing my slide and let her share hers. All right, well, thank you, uh, Susan, for um, that introduction. And thank you to everyone um, for joining us today. This is really exciting to have so many of you. I was watching the ticker there. Um, we're at nearly 500 participants so far. Um, I also just want to say thank you for the uh, amazingly warm welcome um, that I've received since joining UIC uh, July 1st, um, just under two months. Um, I have to say I've been quite busy my first month on the job, had a few projects that I'll share with you and how um, those are translating uh, into work that is to come uh, with respect to the center this fall and in the coming year. Um, I've had some amazing meetings with stakeholders from across campus um, to date who've really helped me to shape the priorities of the center going forward this fall. So I'd like to take the next um, eight to 10 minutes here to share a bit about uh, what we've done and what we have cooking this year. So this is um, just sort of a recap, if you will, of the mission and goals that I ar articulated back in December, um, pre-COVID, <laughs> uh, during my job talk for the CTE. So I just want to take a minute here to briefly summarize some of the, the things that we were thinking about at that time. Um, with the mission of the center really focused on developing a culture of effective teaching practices and inclusive education, supporting the success of all students really seeing the marriage between faculty development and the student success work that is, has been ongoing. And as Susan shared with um, the presentation, has really been contributing to the persistence and success of UIC undergrads to date. Um, with respect to the goals, um, I had articulated six. Um, I won't go into detail, but just to say, um, uh, summarize here, um, goals to provide resources and faculty development programming to design and implement learning opportunities both for current and future faculty the future faculty meaning graduate students such as rtas and postdocs like those in the bridge to faculty program um, and our erecta program which uic just um, was awarded an nih erecta grant this year so that will be another program um, coming to campus to support um, our postdocs, uh, creating spaces for dialogue about instructional practices, um, engaging a community of educators, focused on assessment and scholarly teaching, leading and participating in initiatives to acquire grant funds to support much of this work, and engaging in multidisciplinary collaborations across campus, um, within the region, and even nationally. So I share these with you because of really um, kind of getting us to think about maybe how these have changed 
how things have changed in the teaching landscape, and ultimately how that is shaping some of the priorities of the center going forward this year. But I just wanna say that with respect to these longer term goals, um, they haven't changed with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And if anything, it's really underscored the need to implement programming and develop resources in support of these goals. And I will say that this has even been amplified by the Black Lives Matter social justice movement. So I don't have time to go through all of these and it's, it's sort of a wordy slide, but it was just um, really to sort of underscore the way I'm thinking about the future of the center and how the goals of the center are really shaping the work. So this isn't a comprehensive list, but um, there are a variety of efforts already ongoing um, that align with the goals. And I want to take just a few minutes here in the next several slides um, to share uh, some of these and provide some highlights of the work um, that, that the center has been doing. So as Susan shared with you, we just launched uh, the center website. It went live on Thursday. Um, and you know, managing expectations here, the, the plan is really long term for this website to be a teaching hub um, for all of you to come and find the resources that you need to support teaching um, in any discipline, um, in any college, on any campus. And, and so we've basically set the groundwork for that this summer. The resources that are currently available are really a result of the work that I've been doing in collaboration with the Provost Academic Planning Task Force. So she mentioned the syllabus uh, template and the assessment guidelines that are up there. We're also in the process of building the equity and inclusion toolkit um, and bringing resources that uh, other units on campus have been developing. Um, ACCC has amazing technology resources that we're integrating into the site. Extended Campus has played um, a huge role in really promoting the faculty mentors and the webinars they've been running this, this summer to support faculty in online teaching. The Office of, of Diversity, um, headed by Amalia Polaris and the uh, inclusive um, classrooms initiative, the work that they're doing, the student success initiative and the, the grants and other um, resources, student resources that are available, all of this aligning and really um, coming to a central site here. We'll continue to expand these resources. And I just wanted to point out that what we're trying to do is since we don't have a physical presence on campus, is to really create a website that welcomes you in and creates resources that you can use in your classrooms this fall. So um, a lot of the work we're doing, you'll see this word, word toolkit, uh, where there's some resources that are augmented by technology and other um, types of materials that are available to really help you um, in different areas. So um, these are two. Uh, the assessment guidelines that Susan um, mentioned that are on her website, that was a report um, that came together very quickly this summer by an amazing committee. Um, I've, I've listed the folks here who, who really took charge of this and took advantage of other efforts on campus from College of Education, College of Engineering, the student focus groups, the student uh, surveys that OIR ran in May. Um, it really brought that together into a document with some great uh, recommendations for how to conduct assessments um, in our online learning environment this fall. And I highlight this because this is basically in looking ahead the next tool Toolkit that the center will be developing um, and uh, including on our website to sort of dig in um, to other resources supporting uh, some of the recommendations that were in the guidelines. Uh, I also wanted to announce that um, the center will be hosting some sort of uh, symposium like event this fall. Um, this was inspired by a conversation actually I had yesterday 
uh, with one of the subcommittees and really trying to think about how to bring faculty together this fall to talk to each other about what's happening in the online learning environment, but to do so in a way that does not necessarily require a lot of time and effort to prepare, which is time is definitely not something that uh, we all have a lot of. So we're envisioning some, some short lightning talks uh, where you could come together and share cool digital tools that you're using in your classes, share creative teaching tips with some of the existing tools and pedagogical um, strategies, also lessons learned to let folks know maybe what not to try <laughs> that, that haven't been as successful perhaps as what you thought or harder to implement than what you thought. Um, so look for that. We'll be announcing more about that um, in the coming month. Uh, as Susan also mentioned, um, the Learning Technology Solutions team will be joining the center this fall. Um, this is a really exciting opportunity for the center to truly um, lead instructional um, uh, approaches, innovative approaches, uh, regardless of the modality, whether you're talking about online, as is happening right now, face to face, um, or some combination of that. Um, and so what you'll, you'll, you won't see any, dif any differences right now this fall, uh, so you'll still be able to find the resources you need um, on ACCC's website. Um, but what will be happening behind the scenes is really the seamless integration of the technology and the pedagogy resources um, as we collaborate to really build out the website um, and build out our programming accordingly. Uh, one last thing I'd like to mention, as I, I said, the center is here uh, not just to support current faculty, but also future faculty and our TAs. And so in collaboration with Karen Colley and the Graduate College, um, the center is uh, bringing CERTL to UIC campus. This is another acronym. I've learned a lot of acronyms um, in the course of being here, but here's another one for you that stands for the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning. And this is a network of more than 40 research institutions across the United States and Canada um, that is there to provide uh, opportunities, professional and career development opportunities for graduate students, um, including our TAs and postdocs. And I bring this up because by registering through the network as a, a CERTL affiliated institution, our graduate students and postdocs have free access to all of these amazing online resources to support their teaching. And much of the work since this spring has pivoted uh, to support online teaching. So I really encourage you to encourage your TAs and uh, graduate students, postdocs to check out the resources. I think that they'll find um, a really amazing online learning community um, to engage with. And as Karen and I really start to engage our local learning community, we'll start to see more and more resources here on campus, um, leveraging some of the, the programs and things that already exist. So um, I'll just close by, by sharing uh, this new sort of document that I have been working on. Um, you know, I started off by sharing the mission and goals of the center. And this fall, we'll be organizing uh, what I call a CTE launch committee um, comprised of campus stakeholders from across the, the campus um, to really help think about the, the mission and goals. Um, and reshape them as necessary to reflect the current time um, and the needs of our faculty and students in this time. But what I've really been thinking about is how are we going to implement that? How are we going to work? How are we going to convey those messages to the community? And so I came up with these five um, descriptors and we'll, we'll continue to work on this, but I just wanna say that the work that the center under my leadership um, will really be guided by a spirit of inclusiveness, participation, collaboration, innovation, and excellence. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank you. Um, and please do check out our website when you have a moment. Uh, we also have a support email. So if you have questions, you'd like a consultation, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. I provided the, the email there. Um, and with that, I will stop.
Okay. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, That's terrific. I'm going to uh, share my screen again. I just want to uh, make one point. There was a question about disability <clears throat> access and um, I, I pulled up my UIC, uh, dot pro, uh, provost.uic.edu website. I showed this to you a few minutes ago, the online instructional resources that you can click into, and you will see here there is accessible teaching. There's a terrific document here um, created by the DRC. So anybody looking for that, it's right here uh, on this website, provost.uic.edu. You just go here and that takes you there. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Yao Xiao from the College of Engineering. He is a clinical associate professor in the mechanical and industrial engineering department in the College of Education, uh, of Engineering, sorry. Uh, Yao has been assisting his colleagues transition to remote teaching this whole uh, past five months. He helped draft the College of Engineering guidelines for the fall was part of uh, the workshops uh, online assessment committee uh, led by Aaron O'Leary and recently developed faculty workshops about how to keep students engaged and motivated while learning online. His presentation today is Mix It Up, Building a Welcoming Community. All right, it's all yours, Yao, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Provost, uh, let me share my screen. All right. Um, thank you once again, uh, Provost, for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, to the entire campus community. Um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, if you're in Chicago, or good afternoon or evening, if you're elsewhere. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here feeling inspired, inspired by the Provost's words, inspired by Aaron's words, and I'm still inspired by Michelle Obama's words from last night. Um, and since March, I think a lot of you are the same, the same way. I have been attending a lot of webinars, conferences, workshops, meetings, and committees, and every single event continue to inspire me. And I'm going to stop share just, just one second, actually. Um, Yeah, and uh, it's, it's really comforting to know that there's a community of educators out there that's sharing the same struggle and sharing the same passion as me. <clears throat> and everything that I do now is informed by expert opinions, driven by data, coming from all over the world, but most of all, inspired by something that's much closer to home. You, my colleagues, my peers, my department head, my dean, the provost, and I'm also inspired by my own students, by their drive and by what they're going through. Now, as a professor of engineering, I am training and I'm sending students out into the world with the hope that they are going to make this world a better, safer, and more just place to live for all of us. And that is why their learning matters. Their GPA matters, their skill set matters, their growth matters, their worldview matters, their lives matter, Black lives matter. Because I'm now in the position to empower them, every single one of them. Um, my, my dear colleague, uh, Renata Rivello from uh, Electrical Engineering, told me recently. Uh, loosely, that the good teaching that we normally know of might not be equitable, but equitable teaching is always good teaching. 
Now, COVID really has exacerbated the inequity among our student de demographic. And it is all the more important that we as educators now to create this welcoming community of learners to bring them back, to keep them here, to sustain the learning. And now there are many ways to build a community, especially a warm and welcoming community. I'm gonna show you a few examples that I did and I, what I plan to do. First, a welcome video. I, I invite you to, to crank up your volume of your, uh, your computer speaker. Uh, just a quick super cut of uh, a video that I made. Vibration. Hello, welcome to Vibration. I'm your professor, Yao. First off, a little bit about me. I mean, this semester will be fully online. Now I'll be using something called a blended approach, some okay. essential tools, Blackboard. Blackboard Collaborate, Grayscope, a Piata. Hey, so Slack is an instant messaging you song. You and me, among your classmates, to build a community. Now, what is this class all about? Active noise canceling. Five keys to success for you. Carve out a space in your house. Keep in mind, we're all in this together. See you in class. Next, a syllabus. There's so much more that we can do with our syllabus and especially make it student centered. And that could be simple things like changing the language instead of calling something, say a policy or you know, um, grading, uh, call that how to succeed and how to, how to get an A in this class instead. And also make things simple and easy to find. On Blackboard, for example, make it colorful and build some kind of um, calendar on the homepage. So students, when they come in, right away, they know where to find things, where to jump into whatever community that you have created for them. Now next. No one's going to come to a community without knowing each other. No one's going to come to a cold place. So let's make it warm. We can start by, well, getting to know each other. Now, without the, the convenience of a classroom now, physical classroom, we, we can't see faces anymore. So maybe here's what I do, um, or planning to do. Um, create a Google Slides and let everyone share a little bit about themselves, starting with me. I'm gonna share this as one slide and I'm gonna invite all my students to do the same. Next, check in with them from time to time. And that could be a really good use of office hour. Um, here's what I'm planning to do. For at least twice a semester in the fall, I'm going to invite my students to come in with me, spend just a few minutes, all of them, a one on one meeting, or they can bring a buddy if they want to and just do an initial meet and greet. And then again, maybe halfway through the semester, just to see, you know, to hear about you know, how they're doing. And then if you're doing live classes, synchronous classes, um, there's so much more that you can do than just teach. You, know, you can do something as example or demo or have students collaborate, work together, or just let them vent. Here's what I'm planning to do. Um, on Monday's class, I'm going to do some examples and Q&A. Wednesday's class, student collaboration. And then Friday is a social hour. I'll get together and create, create something or just maybe a makeshift advising session. Students are creative. 
and let them express themselves, create an opportunity, an outlet for them to create themselves. Um, one of the favorite things uh, that I do for my uh, class is I create a, a video project and I did that in the spring. And um, so students have to make a one minute video and then I have them brainstorm ideas about how to make a really good video. And then um, give each other tips and then they go and make a, a video about the class material. And I'm gonna show you a quick example of uh, what student produced. Hello, ME308. Uh, welcome to my Vibrations Project 9. For the purpose of this analysis, we're going to focus just on the snare drum. Next and last, check in with them, poll them to see how they're doing. And for example, you can do an initial, like a weekly uh, poll of the, the lecture or the modality that you, you're using, whether it's working or not. And then one of my favorite things to do halfway through the semester is um, we're actually inspired by uh, my dear colleague, uh, Midi Kochi from uh, bioengineering. It's called Start, Stop, Continue. And, and to gauge how students are really doing and how, how much they're learning. Finally, we're all in this together. And as, the, as you are building a community, keep in mind, we are a community as well. So look to your colleagues and um, we are all in this together. And with that, I hand it back to Provost. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was wonderful. I think I'm going to sign up for your vibrations class. Uh, just thank you. Terrific uh, presentation, inspiring. Um, let's go back to, okay. And um, our final presentation uh, today, our, our final public presentation is by Dr. Lan Chaplin, and she's an associate professor of marketing in the College of Business. She conducts research in the areas of children's consumer well-being, happiness, materialism, and branding. She, she teaches at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. For the past four months, Lan has led the Student Perspective Subcommittee of the Fall 2020 Academic Planning Task Force, during which time she undertook dozens of focus groups to learn more about UIC students' perspective on online education at UIC. The presentation today is entitled, The Student Perspective. And take it away, Lan. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'd like to thank the provost for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Lon Chaplin, and I'm really excited to talk about what my team and I have been doing for the past few months. Um, as the provost mentioned, our team is one of three subcommittees on the task force for fall 2020 planning. And before I begin, I wanna give a shout out to my team members who have devoted many hours to this project. Uh, Tony Corti, Paula Dempsey, Jamie Haney, Stacy McLeod, and Linda Naru. Our subcommittee had two goals, to seek student input on various options for fall 2020 and to see how we can support students in the remote education this fall. Before I go into the details of what our subcommittee did and um, what we learned from our UIC students, I wanted to share with you a little bit about uh, my thought process going into this work. I knew that from UIC students, uh, I knew that for UIC students to benefit from having the subcommittee on the provost task force, everyone on the subcommittee needed to have an open mind and to be very action oriented. So to do my part, I first needed to look at how I was working and acknowledge the differences, the potential differences in how I work from how students might be working. So this is what happens to me during Zooms. And um, when I'm standing in front of a, a Zoom, I, I might be worried that my dog is barking, and so I might place her on my lap to keep her from um, barking so loud. And then I have my kids looking over, at, wondering if I'm in a Zoom or not. I'm sure many of you can identify with this situation. We're all multitasking on a whole new level and adjusting to new ways of working and being productive with different constraints. 
for example, I no longer wear my earbuds during Zooms because one, they're broken, and two, the visual cue that I'm in a Zoom isn't quite clear to my kids. So now I wear a much bigger headset, so there's no question that I'm in a Zoom and should not be disturbed. But you see, like many of you on this webinar today, I have options to adapt. I can switch between headphones when a, when a set breaks or doesn't work as well as I need it to. I can add a Wi-Fi booster so I can work upstairs. I can work at my standing desk if I've been sitting for too long. Um, I can use my audio from my phone, but view the Zoom gallery on my laptop to make it easier on my eyes. And I had been Zooming with my students prior to joining the, the Provost Task Force, so I knew students didn't have all these options. In fact, I knew that many students were driving to a hot spot to complete their assignments in between tutoring multiple siblings who were also learning remotely. So I've been really happy that the provost values the student perspective enough to assemble a subcommittee um, to understand how UIC uh, can support our students. So let's get to what we did. We conducted focus groups um, with undergraduate students, graduate students, international and domestic students, transfers, commuters, uh, as well as on-campus students across 24 majors. We talked to 96 students and we varied the time of day that we conducted the interviews to accommodate students' schedules. After approximately 11 hours of conversations, we learned quite a bit from students. Um, in the interest of time though, I will say that the detailed results are posted on the Provost website and so I'm just going to highlight the big takeaways here. So regardless of format, whether you're teaching remotely, in person, hybrid, synchronously, or asynchronously, this is what students have told us. Care about us and we'll care about your class. So what can UIC do? What can instructors do? This is what's on the student's wish list. Prioritize their health, safety, and well-being. Communicate, email them, email them reminders, check in on them, show kindness and compassion, put humanity first. Engage with students, get to know them. They want to get to know their instructors as well. Write a clear and organized syllabus to keep everything in one place for students and set up a clear and organized Blackboard website for them. Students also shared some concerns with us that I'd like to share with you. Um, so in addition to everything going on at home, if they have to take courses on campus, they're concerned about public transit. They're concerned about whether others will follow UIC's health and safety protocols. And if they're living with older loved ones who are at higher risk, they're concerned that they might bring something home. If they have to go remote this semester, which is the majority of the students, they're worried about staying motivated. So they need professors' help to keep them motivated. UIC is an anchor for them, even for commuters. They're worried about feeling isolated because they're working from home the entire time this semester. They're worried about sharing the workspace with four other siblings and having connectivity issues. And of course, they have the same concerns we have too with Zoom burnout. So what was surprising? Anytime I do any kind of research, I always try to look for what's surprising that I wasn't expecting. And the one thing that was surprising for me was that UIC is a critical anchor for students, even for commuters. So even if they're coming for classes Tuesdays and Thursdays and they take four classes and leave right away, UIC is still an anchor for them. It's where they feel safe. It's where they feel motivated to achieve big things in life. And it's very important for their mental health. So let's look forward. Um, so based on everything that we've, we've learned from these focus groups, I have some action items to offer. How can we act on these group findings? The answer lies in building community. Communicate effectively. So respond to emails promptly, send reminders to students, stay organized in your course structure and delivery, model high standards and compassion. So be very cognizant of students' resource constraints and accommodate as needed. Uh, Yao talked about virtual check-ins and that's really important too because if they can't see you on campus, at least they can Zoom with you maybe. Engage with students and motivate them. So maybe spend five minutes 
at the beginning of lecture, or even two minutes to ask about their interests. Give shout outs to asynchronous students so that they're not forgotten just because they don't see you on a screen. If they are adding input to a Google Doc that's shared in the class or some discussion thread that's shared in the class, then give a shout out to them and, and show your appreciation. Cultivate a safe learning environment for students. And here, one example would be to set up small teams. And teams are more than just a conduit for a course grade. Teams can serve as an important peer support network for students because they don't always feel comfortable reaching out to their professors. But now, if you have them in small teams, they'll reach out to their peers. And in doing so, this becomes their anchor. It may be a remote anchor, an online uh, anchor, but it's still an anchor for students, and that's what they're really looking for. I want to remind everyone that it could be whatever you are doing times six. Many students are taking um, many classes that are completely remote, and it could be six total classes that they're logging on to their Blackboard and seeing all this information rolled out so quickly. So roll it out slowly because whatever you're rolling out, multiply that by six for students to understand where they're coming from and how they might be feeling. Um, so find ways to, to be a constant for our students and try to be an anchor for them during a time of such unpredictability. They need and want to belong to a community, and we can make that happen in the classroom. So next, I'd like to share an example of how I've been applying the focus group results to my course delivery this fall, which has required some changes. I'll be using a ladder technique to build community and achieve the aims of my class. This strategy allows students to comfortably climb and reach something otherwise very difficult to reach. The latter starts students off with low stakes assignments to build confidence. And as the semester progresses, students are climbing up the ladder with more confidence to complete higher stakes assignments. Higher stakes meaning these are now graded assignments. And so um, it's clear on my syllabus that by the end of the semester, students are expected to deliver um, a professional team presentation. Right now, working in groups to completely, um, right now working in groups completely remotely feels absolutely terrifying to students, even though they are digital natives. Um, that's one thing that students have already reached out to share with me is they're absolutely terrified of working remotely with people who they don't know. But that is one of the goals in my class. I'm not going to lower the standards or take that out because I believe that's a very important skill, especially for business students to take away. So the latter technique allows students to climb to where I want them to be by the end of the semester in the company of a very supportive community. Um, so to start, I have a very low stakes assignment that's easy, student focused, and not graded. So when we talk about stakes, we're talking about the degree to which an assignment impacts a student's grade. So low stakes, not graded, um, and it's student focused. They have to answer the question, what do you do for fun? Uh, they're submitting this information through Blackboard, and only I see this information. But on the first day, I'm going to encourage students to share with the class. The next step up would be something a little, um, I'm gonna raise the stakes a little bit, but it's, this is an optional assignment here, which again, I've already reached out to students and I have, um, but it's still relatively low, low stakes here because it's optional, it's not graded. So why, why should they do this assignment? It's a topic that's of interest to them. So I've created a shared PowerPoint slide on the Google Drive and asked students to share what matters to them. And it could be a hashtag, it could be an icon, the stakes are a little higher since it may take a little more courage to share what truly matters to them on a Google Doc with other people. So I'll set up small breakout sessions on these topics so students can lead discussions, share their thoughts, learn from others, build community, and feel supported. This, so in about 36 hours, students dropped information into the Google Drive. And these are, the th these are the topics that matter to them. And so you can be sure that I'll put students into small groups so that they can lead a discussion on, for example, Black Lives Matter or what's happening in Yemen.
as they become more comfortable and confident in sharing their ideas, as well as working with people who they once didn't know anything about, they'll be more motivated to contribute their ideas for higher stakes assignments, such as graded team presentations. And I'm also adding short team building exercises synchronously and asynchronously throughout the semester to build community. For example, I'm teaching a marketing course, okay? And so teams will be competing against each other on a virtual scavenger hunt to look for examples in the marketplace that illustrate concepts that we've discussed in class theories that we've discussed in class. And what does the winning team get? They don't get points. The winning team gets to pick the order of team presentations for the much anticipated semester long project at the very top of that ladder right there. But they get to pick, do they wanna go first? Do they wanna see how some teams go before they go? Or do they wanna go last? Which is critical for these students. So these are just some examples of how I plan to act on the focus group results given my teaching circumstances. We're all teaching very different classes and having very different class sizes. So I do encourage you to take a look at my subcommittee's report on the provost website and act on the results that you find most applicable to your unique teaching situation. So to conclude, I wanna emphasize that no matter what you're teaching, uh, where you're delivering content, whether it be from your living room office or on campus or how many students you have, showing compassion and um, showing compassion and staying organized in your course delivery, reaching out to students, engaging with them will give UIC students a fantastic learning experience this fall. Even if team, um, even if teamwork isn't a natural build into your course, just checking in with them and engaging them would be really beneficial to the students. Thank you. Thank you, Lan. That was terrific and a great way to organize that kind of engagement on campus uh, in class. And I also want to thank you again for your leadership of the subcommittee on the student um, perspective. So let me share my screen again. Okay. So uh, thank you to all three. Let's, I hope you're all at home clapping for these wonderful presentations that we just had. This is a, hard not to have an audience, but um, uh, those were really terrific. And now we're going to move on to uh, breakout sessions. And let me speak for a moment about how they are organized. Um, in order to get into a breakout session, you just go to this link on the chat. And I'm going to click on this so that you can sort of see what happens here. Uh, and, and Kelsey is putting it in the chat uh, so that you can just click on it. You don't have to do anything else. And we will not end the meeting right away. Uh, so that there's time to do that. Uh, you will get to this, uh, this screen here, and these all in this teal color, all of the breakout sessions uh, you can see here. And they're, uh, they're on a, a huge range of subjects. They are all peer led by faculty and staff. And when you click on one, for example, I'll just click on this one, you will see who it is. Your screen. We can't see your screen, it hasn't changed. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Let me see what went wrong here. All right. Now I'll share maybe something. Thank you, Erin. Okay. Now can you see the website? Yes. Okay. And I got there just by clicking on this. Do you see the right here? Um, and so anyway, here are all, here is the list of all of the uh, breakouts, which you will get to if you just click on the link that uh, Kelsey is now putting in the chat. Um, and uh, if you click on one of them, I'll do this successful pivot from on campus. You see the name of the person uh, who's presenting it. And if you just click on this link, it will take you right into the breakout session. So that's how you get in uh, to the breakouts. Uh, so go to this link. And I'm not sure if it's in the chat or if it's in the Q&A but you will be able to find it, or it's also uh, in the email you got yesterday. Uh, scroll through and use the drop-down menu as I just showed you to choose a breakout session. Click on the Zoom link again. I just showed that to you. Um, when the breakout is over, uh, uh, and the first breakout will start at 10.30 and will end at 11.10, you can simply go back to that same link and choose another breakout session. The second breakout session will begin at 11.20, so there's another 10-minute break here. And the retreat is adjourned right at noon when the second breakout session ends. We're not going to come back together 
um, to end the retreat. Uh, and right now there's about a 10 minute break until this very first one starts. If for some reason you lose sight of this link, just go to leadership.uic.edu and on that site, you will see also a link to get into the breakout sessions. This one takes you there uh, just in one click. Um, so let me say one other thing I made a note because I saw something on the Q&A a moment ago. It was, a, it was a question about students who might not have adequate internet access or uh, possibly even um, a laptop. Uh, if you find a student like that, if you hear about anybody like that, ACCC does have hotspots and laptops to provide to students who need them. So if you hear this from a student, please send them directly uh, to ACCC. Uh, to their website, uh, and they'll find they'll figure out the way to uh, contact ACCC about that. So uh, everybody now has a 10-minute break before our breakout sessions. I'm going to flit around uh, among them, uh, and uh, again, all of this will be up on uh, my website as a resource uh, for the whole semester. So thank you again to everybody for attending. Thank you very much. Uh, to our presenters, Lan and Yao and Aaron. Um, and uh, hopefully you will all uh, see each other in one way or another uh, in the breakouts, which begin in 10 minutes. Thanks very much. And we'll, we'll hold this so that you can uh, use that link now. And have a wonderful semester. <laughs>